All right, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Good morning, as I said, good morning to everybody here, but good morning to those of you that are tuning in through the live stream. Glad you can be here this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to give you something this morning that I, the Lord gave me in my Bible reading. It was something that I've read, a, I don't know, I wouldn't say a million times, but <laughs> I've read many times. And uh, I've never even given it much thought. And truthfully, I've never heard any, anyone teach or preach on this particular thing that I'm going to cover this morning. And so when I read this, I thought, you know, what is that talking about? And I hope that's what you do when you're reading your Bible. When you're reading something and something doesn't make sense and you say, uh, God, what, what does this even mean? And just ask the Lord uh, for understanding, and sometimes He'll show you, and sometimes He won't, and sometimes He won't, and sometimes He'll show you months down the road, and you'll forget you even asked. But 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says here in verse 1, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then he says this, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I come before you, and I do thank you, God, for giving us the scriptures. Thank you for the truth. I do pray you'd speak through me. Fill me with your spirit, and I pray that you'd speak to your people and edify them this morning. God, this is your book. We believe it. We believe that this whole book is true and is the truth. And I just pray you speak through me and I uh, trust you for that. And I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So he says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now, what I want to start here with this morning is uh, Paul is revealing his hard attitude toward the ministry. And what he says here really should be all of our attitudes, because in the context, when he says ministry in chapter five, a couple of verses prior, he talks about the ministry of reconciliation, which is simply beseeching people or imploring people to be reconciled to God. Now, this would include exhorting Christians. Christians who are backslidden to be reconciled to God. That's part of the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling, reconciling a Christian that's gone wayward with their father. Um, also, part of the ministry of reconciliation involves bringing a lost person to Jesus Christ. So the ministry of being an, an ambassador or reconciling people to God really is a, is a ministry for everyone. So I don't want to uh, isolate this passage from the majority of Christians just because you're not a pastor or a missionary doesn't mean that this doesn't apply to you. All right, we're all called to the ministry of reconciliation. But as Christians, we need to take that title seriously and pay attention to how we live because as an ambassador, we are representatives of God. We are here in Christ's stead as he says there in first uh, second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 there. And what people see in us will reflect what people think of God. That's just the way, that's just how it goes. Bear this in mind as a father, the way you treat your children and the way you are as a father will be inevitably the way your children naturally think of God the Father. So it's important to raise your kids and to, and to be a good father to your children. And the way that we should be fathers is we should take after God our Father and treat our children the way God treats us. Because we want to be a reflection of God. We, when our children think of God as a father, they're, they're only going to think of the only father they know. And if a, if a human father is going to be very uh, harsh, very severe, uh, very short-tempered, that's how they're going to think of God. Or, or a father that's very distant, that doesn't love their, their children, doesn't care about their children, doesn't care about the things their children care about, that's how your children are going to think of God. So it's important that you keep that in mind. In the unsafe world, whether you like it or not, it's the same way. What they see in Christians is a reflection on what they're going to think of God. Even if that's not accurate, that's just how they're going to think. So Paul made it a point to be very careful and very diligent that he'd give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now, offense or offend in the Bible has a few different definitions. It can mean a few different things and show up in a few different contexts. But one way the word offend or offense is used in the Bible 
is the typical way we think of it, used to upset somebody. You know, oh, you offended me. You know, uh, uh, that was a microaggression, and now I'm offended, you know, because you addressed me by my proper pronoun, uh, a he or a she, and so now I'm offended. <laughs> you know, uh, one time in the Bible it says, Matthew 15, 12, then came his disciples and said unto Jesus, Knowest thou not that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So that's one of the ways the word offend is used in the Bible. Another way the word offend is used is uh, to mean, it means to cause someone to quit or to fall away. And uh, that's the usage in uh, like when Jesus told John the Baptist, you know, blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. Uh, it means to fall away, to quit, to be done with Christianity, to just be done with it. Um, Psalm 119, 165 says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Usually we take that to mean nothing is going to make you mad. Nothing's ever going to rub you the wrong way. That's not the way the word offense is used in that passage. It means nothing shall offend them in the sense that nothing is going to cause you to fall. Nothing is going to cause you to quit. Nothing is going to cause you to fall out of the Christian life. What? If, condition, you love the word of God. Literally, there's nothing in the Christian life that is too powerful to cause you to fall out. And that's what Brother Mark preached on this morning. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will also make a way, a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. No Christian ever has to fail. Many do, but they don't have to. Okay. And then the third way the word offend is used is it means to transgress against someone. Um, in Jeremiah 37, 18, it says, Moreover, Jeremiah said unto King Zedekiah, What have I offended against thee, or against thy servants, or against this people, that ye have put me in prison? What's my crime? So a transgression is, there's a line in the sand that you do not cross, and you cross it. And that's one way you can offend somebody. You can hurt somebody very bad through a sin or a transgression against that person. So let's think about this. You know, the truth... Paul says he, he doesn't want to give offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. The truth is going to offend people. The truth is going to upset people and make them angry. And Paul obviously wasn't concerned about making people angry. Obviously, if you're going to tell the truth, some people are not going to like it. Apostate preachers are worried about upsetting people with the truth. That's the kind of offense they're worried about. They don't want to uh, offend anybody, right? So they water down their preaching, they candy coat sin, and they emphasize the positive and completely ignore the negative. All right, so Paul wasn't worried about that kind of offense. As a matter of fact, a few verses later, he talks about the people that he had offended through his preaching <laughs> and what they did to him and threw him in jail about it. But uh, Paul was concerned with actual transgression. He didn't want to do something that was sinful that would cause the ministry to be blamed. He didn't want to cross any lines. He didn't want to transgress whether it was uh, you know, against the brethren or do anything morally wrong that would cause the ministry to look bad and cause God to look bad. And so he was very careful to live his life in such a way that was consistent with the Christianity that he professed. He didn't want to be involved with, uh, uh, be, he didn't want to be blamed. Now, you can be accused, but that doesn't mean that the accusation is necessarily true. Blameless in the Bible involves you being clean, living in a clean way. A preacher is supposed to be blameless. Harmless. That's how we're all supposed to be as Christians. So people might accuse you of things, but as long as it's not true, you're blameless, all right? So anyway, if you're saved, the things you do and the way you live affects what people think of God, whether you like it or not. And if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then you need to try and live what, like one, okay? If you have no intention of doing right, and you just want to live life your way and do your thing, that's your own foolish choice, but whatever you do, don't go around telling everybody that you're a Christian. You're bringing offense to the ministry. You're bringing offense to the title, the name of Christ. In verse 4, Paul says this, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes and imprisonments, in tumults and labors and watchings and fastings. Okay? So basically, in all circumstances of life, you should approve yourself or prove to those around you that you are indeed a Christian. In all circumstances, good or bad. You say, well, how so? Well, in all of life's situations, whether good or bad, the following should be characteristic of your life. Look at verse 6. In all circumstances, you should have this. This should characterize you. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. This is how you're approved. 
by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now, I want to draw your attention to that phrase, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on, and on the left. My question is, what exactly does that even mean? <laughs> what does that mean? The, the armor on the right hand and on the left. I mean, if you're going to put armor on, you just take for granted that it's supposed to be on the right and the left. I mean, nobody puts half a coat of arms on, you know, or anything like that. But Paul says, hey, it's important to me that the armor be on the right hand and on the left. I mean, what would it mean... If you had the armor of righteousness, and we're familiar with the Christian armor there in Ephesians chapter 6, but what would it mean if you were a Christian and you had the armor of righteousness on the right hand, but not on the left? Or if you had it on the left hand, but not on the right? What does that even mean? <laughs> what is that talking about? What is this right hand, left hand business in the Bible? Well, uh, take a moment and quietly think to yourself, what it means to have the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Okay, so this is a little bit of a quiz. Think about it for a second, and I'll check back at the end of the lesson to see if you got it right. Because <laughs> there actually is a definition. I didn't know this. But there actually is a meaning what that means to have armor on the right hand and on the left, not just one side or the other. So think in your mind, okay, I think that might mean this. And then we'll come back to it at the end of the lesson and see if you got it right. All right? Now, the Bible does explain it, but we're going to have to do some studying to figure it out. So I'll have some verses for you to turn to. Uh, go ahead and look at, uh, I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 and Proverbs chapter 4. And while you're going there, I'm going to read you a couple of verses, okay? Proverbs, go to Proverbs chapter 4 first, all right? So the Bible frequently talks about not departing to the right hand or to the left when it comes to keeping God's commandments. All right. In Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 32, and you don't have to turn there. I'll just read this for you. It says, ye shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you, ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. All right? So you're not supposed to go to the right hand or to the left. That's, how, that's the phrase that's used in the Bible. Joshua 1.7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So there's that phrase again. The right hand and the left. We're trying to figure out what does that mean. Look at Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 25. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what it means to have the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now, the idea with these verses is you're supposed to stay on the center. You're supposed to stay on the straight path, and you're not supposed to go to the right or to the left. Because, and, and whether you go to the right or you go to the left, both are equally wrong. You're supposed to stay on this center path. Um, that doesn't really fit with what we have there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The armor of righteousness on the right hand and the left. That's a completely different thing, so we'll have to pass that and go to the next thing to see what it's talking about. We'll have to keep digging. Okay, because that doesn't make sense, armor in the center. So we'll keep digging and see what we can find. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. In verse 13, it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Skip down to verse 16. Length of days, okay, so the context is wisdom. It says, Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. So, right hand, left hand. In her right hand is, I'm just going to put this here, length of days... These are my terrible hands. And over on the left hand is uh, riches and honor. Now this will be interesting as you see how this goes. This is going to be a Bible study today. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, the next book in your Bible. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I've got a lot of scriptures here, so we'll keep it moving. But Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and look at verse 2. A wise man's heart it is at his right hand, 
but a fool's is at his left. Oh, okay. So we're we're getting on we're on to something now. Um, question based on Ecclesiastes 10:2. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. So question: Are you wise or are you a fool? <laughs> Based on Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 2. Is your heart at your right hand or at your left? And you're probably thinking, I don't know. <laughs> what are you even talking about? What is that verse even saying? Because it says a wise man's heart is at his right hand, a fool's at his left. So are, you're either wise or you're a fool. So which one are you? And uh, you say, what is that even talking about? Well, that's what we're going to find out this morning. All right. Physiologically, interestingly enough. Physically, physiologically, your literal heart is in the center of your chest, but slightly shifted to the left side. I find that interesting. Two thirds of your heart is, is toward the left side of is left of center, and one third of your heart is right of center. And it's interesting that God made the human body that way. God made it that way. I wonder if Adam and Eve had that thing perfectly centered, and then when they sinned, that thing went to the left a little bit. And the reason why I think that is because it says a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Uh, God designed the human body to reflect the fact that all men are fools by nature. Because a fool's heart is at his left, and the human heart is shifted mostly to the left. Most, man is born a fool. The Bible says in Job 11, 12, For vain man would be wise, though he be born like a wild ass's colt. The modern, the modern version should say, Man is born like a jackass. <laughs> That's what that is. A wild ass's colt. You're an idiot. You're born a fool. Romans 3, 10 says, There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's man at his human nature. Is Ezra, pay attention. Israel, keep your hands to yourself. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we are all born with a heart both physically and spiritually, that leans towards the left, that leans towards foolishness. David said, Incline mine heart unto, my, unto thy testimonies, right hand, and not unto covetousness. What was over here? Riches and honor. Hmm. Left hand, right hand. You know, it's interesting. The left hand is generally associated in the Bible with something bad. Uh, after the Battle of Armageddon, the world is uh, gathered to King Jesus at Jerusalem, and uh, he severs the righteous from the wicked, right? There in Matthew 25, and the sheep are on his right hand, and what's on his left? The goats. Matthew 25, 33 says, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There's another thing we can throw in here. Blessed. We can put sheep over here. But what does it say about the wicked? In verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's the goats. You see that left hand, right hand stuff? Uh, shown up throughout the Bible? Interestingly enough, the Latin word dexter, Latin, dexter in Latin means right-handed. Sinister in Latin means left-handed. That's no joke. Sinister is a left-handed thing. If you're left-handed, you're sinister. <laughs> and uh, that, it literally means left-handed in, in Latin. And so I find it interesting that, uh, you know, as far as the left goes, we associate uh, Democrats, right, <laughs> with the left, right? And uh, their party is represented by a donkey, by a jackass, and they call themselves the left. I think it's actually fairly appropriate when you start to think about it, what the Democrats are involved in. I didn't make that up. That's just what they came up with. And that's what the Bible, that's what the Bible talks about. It's like they say, left-handed people can't do anything right. <laughs> so so that's, 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 that's just the way it is. If you have common sense, you'll know that. All right, now, uh, <laughs> now we still haven't figured out, though, what Paul meant when he said armor on the right hand and on the left. What is that even talking about? All right, turn to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Right now what we're doing is we're getting 
some verses and we're getting some information gathered here to see what we're dealing with. Job 23, and in verse 8, it says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him, he hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. All right, so that's interesting. God, Job says that God works... I'm going to put the, uh, the works of God, oops, works of God on the left hand. He says that's where God works, but on the right hand is where God himself, he himself is on the right hand, but I cannot see him. Okay. So, so far, all of these verses that we've looked at haven't been really helpful in defining what Paul was talking about. Righteousness on the right hand and on the left. You can take this information and you still haven't really come up with anything yet. So let's go to look at uh, one more verse. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. And we're trying to define what this is talking about. Now what we're doing here, what I'm showing you this morning, what I'm demonstrating here in the first 15 minutes of this Bible study, is we are comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's what the Bible says there over in uh, 2 Timothy. We're supposed to compare Scripture with Scripture. We're, this is called studying the Scriptures. We found something that we didn't understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. Armor on the right hand and on the left. We don't understand what that means. So instead of inventing our own interpretation, well, I think that means this. Rather than inventing something in our mind, what we're doing is we're searching the scriptures to find similar verses that will provide additional insight to what Paul was talking about. Anybody can do this in preparing a Bible study. And I want to point this out because sometimes people think, oh, Matt, you're so smart. You know, and, and I, I study my Bible, but really anybody can study the scriptures. All I did for this Bible study is I simply found something that didn't make sense, got out a concordance, looked up the words right hand, left, right, left, hand, those three words, and looked up all the verses in the Bible that have right, left, and hand in the verse. There's about 62 of them, I think it was. Then I go through every single verse and see if I can find something that defines what Paul was talking about. Anybody can do this. Um, I have a Bible app on my phone that I use all the time, really good for finding these things out. And so uh, you too can do this anytime. Any Christian can do this. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. That's not just for a minister. That's for every Christian. No doubt you read through this Bible and you say, I don't know what that's talking about. It happens to me about every day. <laughs> this is a big book, folks. Uh, this is a lot of pages here to read. And there's a lot of stuff in here that doesn't make any sense to me. And so what I do is I get out my concordance and I study. I type in the word that I'm trying to figure out. And if you'll do that, God will show you some amazing things personally in your own personal walk with God. God will show you connections you never saw before and that you wouldn't have gotten in church. Because there's only so much I can give you. But when you're studying the Bible for yourself and the Holy Spirit shows it to you, there's something about it that just locks it in. And it makes a difference in your life. You need to do that. You know, this is just free, but you should download a Bible app that has the King James on it, the King James Bible, and has a good concordance that lets you search words and phrases. I think Olive Tree is a pretty good app. If somebody doesn't have a Bible app on their phone that has a concordance, Olive Tree is pretty good. I've got one called Cadre Bible. It's not available anymore, but... Uh, um, I don't know. Does anybody else have any good Bible apps that have concordances in it? What what ones would you guys recommend? You guys you have one in particular that you use? I don't even mind. I have to look at it. Oh, it's okay. It's no big deal. You guys don't have to look it up. I was just thinking for the sake of the listening audience, you know, if somebody wanted one, there's Jakarta. Jakarta? Okay. Chakarta? Tukarta. Tukarta. Okay, I don't think I've heard of that one. So Tukarta is a really good one. It has the Bible and a concordance on it. And uh, eSword, for those of you that use computers, is a free program that has a really good concordance and a Bible on it too. All right. So now for the definition. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to find out what Paul is actually talking about when it says armor on the right hand and on the left. And it's very important. You don't want to be one of those Christians that's just half clothed with armor. All right, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. 
Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. Okay, so in order to get this, you're going to have to follow what Jesus is saying here. Follow a few concepts here. He's contrasting men who can be seen and who see uh, with his Father, who is unseen. Okay, so we've got two categories going on here. In verse 2, he says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. All right, so what the Pharisees were doing is they would do things to draw attention to themselves. They did all of their good deeds out in the open, right, where everybody could see them because they wanted recognition and praise of men. But this is what they should have done. Look at verse 3. But when thou doest alms, let not thy... And alms is basically giving to the poor, giving money, giving away money, charity. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. All right? So what does that even mean? Is that saying that, you know, uh, when we give money to charity or to missions or to the church or to the poor, uh, our left hand shouldn't know what our right hand is doing. So if you're going to give, you need to make sure your left hand is in your pocket so it can't see or, or I have to have one hand behind my back when I give. So that way my left hand doesn't know what my right hand's doing. And what is that talking about? Verse 4, he explains it. That thine alms may be in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. All right? So the right hand is associated with the father, who is unseen. And the right hand is associated with doing things in private. Okay? That is going to be key. The left hand is associated with... Men who can be seen and has to do with things that are in public. And I'm also just going to throw it out there that the right hand has more to do with spiritual things. The left hand has more to do with physical things. Okay? Private public. If you get that, you're going to get this thing. All right. Jesus is saying when it comes to giving money to the Lord, don't let the public know what you're doing in private. Okay. The whole world doesn't need to know how much money you donated. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you want to put money in the box there in the back and you want to, you know, give something to the Lord, give something to the church, give something to missions. That doesn't mean that you have to make sure nobody's watching. You know, and when everybody's kind of chatting, you know, you kind of run over there and stick it in there. And then somebody comes around the corner and sees you by the thing. And, you know, you turn around. Oh, I was just getting some coffee. What are you doing here? You know, it's, it's not talking about being that secretive, you know, to where nobody's allowed to know if you gave anything. You know, that's not what Jesus is talking about. The idea is you're supposed to give out of a cheerful, charitable heart as unto the Lord and not with the motive of getting recognition and praise to impress people with how charitable you are. You know, if you give to them, like I've said in the past, if you put, give through electronically through the tablet back there, there's not going to be a trumpet sound that goes off when you give, although that would be hilarious if we did that sometimes. <laughs> you swipe your card. Doo, 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 doo. I, I, that'd be a funny joke. I don't know how to do that. So nobody has to worry about me pulling that prank. But uh, <laughs> I think that would be funny sometimes. But uh, anyway, Jesus continues the thought in the verse, in verse 5. He says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. It has to do with doing it out in public. All right? And it says they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So we have left hand, right hand, uh, public, private. Okay? God himself, uh, let's see. So uh, let's consider these other verses now that didn't make any sense before. Now we're going to do a little bit of backtracking and get some uh, insight here in Job. Go back to Job 23. And you're going to, these verses that didn't really make any sense that we were kind of looking up, now all of a sudden this is going to start making a little bit more sense. Job 23, 
<clears throat> we're just here, but look at verse 8. Job says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him, on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. So God does his work, where? Out in the world, out in the open, but we cannot see him. We can see his work. The Bible says in Job 36, 24, Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Men see the creation of God. They see the hand of God. They see God's hand in providence, even though you can't see an actual hand. You can see what God's hand has done by all of creation around you, and by God's working in your life, doing different things that, you know, providence this is what we would call it. The unseen hand. God doing things. We can see what He's doing, but we can't see him himself, okay? So that's the works of God on the left hand. All right? And then he says, He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. So God's works are out in the open where men can see what he's done and is doing, but God himself is on the right hand in that secret place. God himself is hidden in the secret place, and if you want to know God himself, that's where you're going to have to find him is in secret. If you want to know God's power, spend time out in the open world, out in nature, out in public. But if you want to know God's personality, that's on the right hand. That's where you're going to have to be in secret. And it's going to be private, where it's just you and God. That's where you're going to get that. Psalms 91.1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. I hope you spend private time with God. Private time with God. Proverbs chapter 3. Church is public. If this is all of God that you get all week, you're not going to know much about God. You need to spend that private time with God in the morning, preferably, or at night, before bed in the morning. You know, David said, uh, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. So if you can do it three times a day, great. But uh, hey, spend some private time with God where it's just you and God before the day gets crazy. All right, every day. Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Verse 16. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. All right, so this is interesting. The implication here is that the right hand and the left hand are good. You know, in her right hand is length of days, and the left hand riches and honor. It's interesting that riches and honor are physical and visible. Right? Fame and fortune. Riches and honor. And have to do with what men see. And those are in the left hand. Length of days, though, has to do with life and isn't exactly tangible. Right? Uh, per se. Life is more along the lines of something spiritual. And long life is something that's not recognized by people until way later on in your life. Mark might have long life, bless, be blessed by God with long life right now, but I can't tell just looking at him. You know? <laughs> Same here. That's something that people don't see until, you know, the latter years of life. Now, if you seek after wisdom, generally speaking, you'll be blessed with both, okay? But let me ask you this. Which is more important? The length of days, the life, or the riches and honor? Which one's more important? Either one. They're both good, but uh, the left hand, you have riches, honor, popularity, notoriety. On the right, you have length of days, you know, fulfillment, a long, fulfilling, satisfying life. If you could choose one or the other, we know as Christians that the right hand is the way to go. Okay? Um, but what do all men naturally lean towards and seek after? What's on the left hand? Because the heart of the fool is towards the left. He's seeking the riches and honor. I don't know what you said there, but I'm sure you got it right. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Naturally, men seek the fame and the fortune. That's what they want naturally. The majority of people, and unfortunately a lot of Christians, seek after worldly riches and honor that comes from men. They see what wisdom's holding in the left hand, and that's what they go for. And they don't pay much attention to the, r the length of days in the right hand. All right? Their heart leans towards the left, and consequently they're fools because of it. The, Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
So if you were to seek the left hand or the right hand, the best thing to do would be seek the right hand first, right? Uh, so the, the associations is the left hand. We have, you know, physical things, luxury, men, public, public. The right hand, you have spiritual things, life, God himself, and it's private. Ecclesiastes 10.2, look at that one again. I know you've already seen it, but go ahead and just look at it again. These verses are now starting to make sense. Because we've compared Scripture with Scripture, and we found the verse that defines what that's talking about. So now we can start making some application. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 2. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. So again, I ask you, are you a, are you a wise or a fool? Do you, is your heart, the things that you desire, the things that you seek after, is it the left hand? Or are you wise? Because the thing that your heart is after, that you seek after, is on the right hand. Are you after physical things and riches and fame and to be seen and revered of men? Or do you seek after the things on the right hand, the spiritual things, the things that pertain to God, where you're not going to get a lot of notoriety, but you're after what's right and you're after the things that God is after? Are you wise or a fool? All right. A wise man will seek after those spiritual things, but a fool will seek after those physical things. Now, the other application here, there's one more thing that I want to draw your attention to. And it actually fits the verse a little better where it says a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. OK, getting back to the public private thing. Remember, Jesus said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay, so a wise man, his heart is at his right hand. What's on the right hand? Private. A fool's heart is where? At his left hand. Is public. Now let's think about that. So a wise man then will keep the things in his heart. His heart is at his right hand. It's private. The things in his heart, he keeps it secret. Or at least he'll think before he speaks. <laughs> Whereas a fool will publicly reveal everything that's in his heart. Proverbs 12, 23 says, A prudent man concealeth knowledge. Right? There are some things that you know about that everybody else doesn't need to know about. But then it says, But the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. Because their heart is at their left hand and it's public and open to everybody. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Proverbs 29.11 says a fool, a fool, uttereth all his mind. The other word for mind in the Bible that's directly connected is your heart. A fool utters all that's in his heart. And that's at his left hand. But a wise man, what? Who, who can finish the proverb? Keepeth it in until afterwards. It's at his right hand. His heart is at his right hand where it's a little more private. He doesn't show all his cards. Okay, Now, this is very applicable when it comes to social media. Okay, <laughs> A fool uttereth all his mind. <laughs> and uh, social media is all about telling the entire world what your opinion is. And uh, my, 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 how many stupid things have been posted to social media? You know, someone hears something about someone else and then tweets their opinion or comments on their post, right? And I'm all for truth, and I'm all for putting out truth, and I'm all for getting it out there. But truth is one thing, but you as an individual need to be able to differentiate between what your opinion is and what the actual absolute truth is. There is such thing as truth, and there is such thing as your opinion. Sometimes your opinion lines up with the truth. Sometimes your opinion is not quite the truth because you're not really sure what the truth is, but you just have an opinion. Just make sure you understand the difference between those two things. Just because it came from your brain doesn't necessarily make it the truth. <laughs> and uh, how many people's spirits have been completely crushed by someone sharing on social media something that was spoken in trust and confidence? Happens all the time. How many reputations have been destroyed by people posting and retweeting a rumor that wasn't even true to begin with? The fool's heart is at his left. Oh, I heard this, so... You know? <laughs> Didn't even verify it. How many people have ruined their own lives by posting something that they couldn't take back? 
A fool's heart is in his left hand. A fool uttereth all his mind, but the wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. You got to be sure to get the facts first before you go telling everybody what you think you know. And if what you heard about someone doesn't concern you, you know, don't spread it. Keep it to yourself. Ecclesiastes 10.2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. A wise man keeps what's in his heart private. At least he's not hasty to speak, okay? He that hasteth with his feet sinneth, right? The hasty, hastiness is bad in the Bible. A wise man has a filter, okay? There's a saying that says, if you didn't hear it with your own ears or see it with your own eyes, then don't invent it with your small brain and share it with your big mouth. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. A fool's heart is at his left. He just spews everything out. There's no filter. It's just all public, okay? So remember... All right. Uh, a, wi a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now, I'm not one of those people, just for the record, okay, just to give the balance here. I'm not one of those people who thinks that nothing negative should ever be said. To the contrary, sometimes things need to be said and should be said, even about other people that is negative. Okay? Even in the scriptures, Paul talked about hyme uh, heretical Hymenaeus and backslidden Demas to Timothy. That's a letter for all of us to read, you know. Uh, John talked about Diotrephes, the pastoral demagogue, to Gaius, who was a member of, pa of Diotrephes' church. You talk about going around somebody's back. Diotrephes was out of line. And John, wasn't a, John didn't hesitate to tell Gaius, yeah, he's out of line. And this is what he's doing. Okay, that's truthful information. So the sanctimonious idea that says you're automatically bad if you say something bad about somebody else is nonsense and is unbiblical to boot. You've got to be careful about that. What you need to be sure of, though, I'm not advocating going around stabbing people in the back and just putting out all the information you know. We've already talked about that. But what you need to be sure of is, number one, check your motive for why you're telling a story. Is it to make you look good and someone else to look bad? Or is it to gain points, maybe, with the person that you're talking to? Or maybe the reason that you're sharing this information is because, well, if I give them something that's private, maybe they'll give me back some information that I've been... That some juicy information. If you're going to get juicy information, you've got to give juicy information. You know, that's kind of how that stuff works. What is your motive for telling the story? Number two, when it comes to uh, speaking negative truth, and sometimes it needs to be done. Number two, make sure you are extremely factual and as exact as possible, okay? If you fudge the story, embellish the story, exaggerate the story, leave out critical elements of the story, you're not just talking, you are bearing false witness. You're not accurately re representing what happened. That's bearing false witness. If you're going to share information, behave like you're testifying under oath be before Congress. Because in reality, you are speaking within earshot of the judge of the universe, and you will give an account for every idle word that you've spoken. So make sure you say the story right. I, tell my, I told uh, Ezra this the other day. Ezra has a way of just kind of... You know, kind of fudging the facts a little bit. <laughs> and I told him, you need to be like a parrot. You know, I say, well, Polly want a cracker. You know, not Polly wants to go to the store and spend his money on, uh, on bread and things like that. No, tell the exact information. <laughs> Polly want, you know, say the exact thing. Repeat it verbatim. Don't give me your interpretation of what somebody, of what you think somebody meant when they said it. Tell me the real information. Man. That happens all the time. And if you're not sure of the facts, keep it to yourself. But number three, make sure you've heard both sides before making a final judgment call. Okay? It's okay to hear one side and have an opinion, but you cannot make final judgments or condemnations until you've heard both sides. Right? Oh, you know, so-and-so doesn't like so-and-so anymore? They said, what? Oh, well, I don't like them anymore either. <laughs> That's the wrong way of looking at things. That's not, that's not right. Saying, I don't like them either, is making a judgment. Now, you can say, well, if that's true, I disagree with what they said. You can say, oh, well, if that's true, then I can see why you think that way. But since I haven't confirmed it myself, I have to remain neutral. Okay, that's fine. 
But when a person hears one side and then makes a judgment, that's called being partial in judgment and being a respecter of persons because you're drawing lines in the sand and siding with one person against another without hearing the other side. And the reason why I point this out is because this is so common today. This happens everywhere. This is happening in politics. You see it in politics and the news all the time. Uh, this happens in churches. This happens in relationships. And this goes on all the time. We have Pastor Nicolaitis, who decides he doesn't like Brother Billy Bob. And so everyone in the church and everyone in the camp decides that they all of a sudden don't like Brother Billy Bob either. Because Pastor Nicolaitis doesn't. That's the only reason. Pastor, how about this? Maybe you know of some stories like this. I know I do. Pastor Nicolaitis gets offended over something Missionary Antipas said. And so he drops Missionary Antipas' support... And then all the other pastors who like Pastor Nicolaitis and want Pastor Nicolaitis to like them, they also drop Missionary Antipas' support. Why? They don't know why. Other than, well, you know, Pastor Nicolaitis is a very spiritual man. He's ten times more spiritual than any of us combined, and his ways are not our ways, and so if he thinks that he should drop a Missionary Antipas, then obviously we should too. No, you're a respecter of persons. <laughs> and you can't seem to fathom that maybe Pastor Nicolaitis got it wrong. Yeah, I, I, I just want to put that out there and put it on the video because this is going on right now in the Bible-believing movements. And it's disgusting and it's sick and it's wrong and it's sinful. And so I thought I'd just share that with the body of Christ. All right? Now... Now, I'm, now that, that kind of stuff, it, it does. It wreaks spiritual havoc in the church and in the body of Christ, and it's messed up. So it's so important that you be truthful and set truth above your preferences, your opinions, and your feelings. Now, to conclude, we started with Paul's statement in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, about having the arm of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And we pondered, you know, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, based on what we've studied this morning, a Christian is to exercise and be characterized by righteousness, both on the right hand, in private, and on the left, in public. You should have the armor of righteousness in public and in private. Not just in public, and not just in private, but both. If you're careful... To do right out in public, where everybody sees you, but then you cut corners in private, you have armor on your left hand, but not on your right. Because you're doing right out in public, you're like a soldier that has half of a helmet on, and half of a breastplate on, and half of your armor here, and half of your armor on your leg, but you've got nothing on this side. You not only look like an idiot, but... Uh, you know, where do you think the enemy is going to attack you? Where would you attack? If you're, wearing, if you're only doing right out in public, you know where the devil's going to hit you? It's going to be in private. Yeah. Isn't that where a lot of pastors find themselves? You know, they have a ministry out in the open that looks great. But in private, the devil's pounding them, got them. And it's only a matter of time before what's in private comes out in public. What were we hearing about the, oh yeah, we heard about an evangelist on the radio. On, it was a focus on the family. We were driving, just skipping through stations, and there was an evangelist, uh, daughter of an evangelist. I don't know who this evangelist was, but her dad was an evangelist and would preach and do all this stuff. But this girl's story was that he was beating her and her mother her whole life. He was a very violent person. What's wrong there? Oh, well, he had armor on the left hand, but he didn't have armor on the right. That's the problem. Don't be like that. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, the, it's called the breastplate. He's talking about the armor of righteousness. And in Ephesians chapter 6, the breastplate is called the breastplate of righteousness, right? It's interesting that righteousness has not only to do with doing the right thing, but with judging right also, or making the right decision. Doing the right thing is preceded by deciding the right thing. You make the decision first, and then you follow through. So you have decide and then do. Righteousness and judgment. Okay? The New Testament Christian has a breastplate called the breastplate of righteousness, 
and you're supposed to be righteous and do right in private and in public. But it's interesting, the Old Testament high priest also had a breastplate in the Old Testament. And guess what it was called in Exodus chapter 28, verse 15. Does anybody remember the breastplate that the priest had? Yeah, it's called the ephod, but it has a, it, God gave it an interesting title in Exodus 28, 15. He calls it the breastplate of judgment. So the New Testament soldier has a breastplate of righteousness. The Old Testament priest had a blessed breastplate of judgment. But righteousness and judgment go hand in hand. They're almost the same thing. Judgment has to do with deciding the right thing. Righteousness has to do with doing the right thing. Okay? So... You need, as a Christian, to do right in public and in private. You need to make right decisions in public and in private. Make the right decisions. And you need to do right and decide right, make right decisions, when everybody is watching. And you need to do right and make the right decisions when no one is watching. When it's only God watching. And what that means is you need to have the armor of righteousness on the right hand in private and on the left in public. So do you have armor on the right hand and on the left? I hope you do. It's a good self-checkup. See if you've got the whole armor of God on right now. Or if maybe you only have half. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning, and I do thank you, God, for the scriptures. Lord, uh, like I said, I, I, didn't, I didn't know this information last week. <laughs> this is something you gave me in my Bible reading this week. And, uh, God, it, it, it was really interesting, Father, uh, that I had never seen that before. I just, it's just amazing what this book has in it. And uh, there's a lot of uh, information. There's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of riches still to, still to be uncovered in this Bible. And I just pray that this uh, sermon would be a blessing to your people. I pray that it would edify them. I pray, Father, that there'd be some repentance in your people, God, that maybe have armor on the uh, right hand or the left hand, but not on the right. Maybe out in public it looks good, but in private uh, there's a few corners being cut. There's a few compromises there. I pray, Father, that you'd help your people, God, to have the armor on the right hand and on the left. Help us, Lord, not to deceive ourselves into thinking that as long as we do a few things on the outside that we're good. Father, that you're looking on the heart. You're looking at the things uh, that we do in private. And as it's been said, uh, reputation is what people see on the outside, but character is what people see when it's all in private, when nobody's watching, and or at least what God sees, Father. So anyway, I pray, Father, that uh, you bless your word. I pray that uh, your people would be strengthened by it, and I trust by faith they will. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.